HRC, 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 Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. Hope you all enjoying the Shabbat today. And hope you all are being prospered in the faith of Yache and striving, working, learning, implementing, and building in this calling that we're called unto. We hope you've enjoyed the first part of this lesson, Understanding Spiritual Fornication and Idolatry. Hope it's been really helpful in grasping what's going on and what we need to do. And we hope to continue understanding and building with part two of this lesson today. Uh, anything before we get going, Zachwa? Well, no, I'm ready, brother. Right, let's ride. We're picking up. Let's get insight on the spirit of fornication herself. Who is fornication? You already know she's mother of all evils, bringing us near to Belier by drawing us from Alahayim, according to Simeon. Let's learn more about her and how she does this. Can you read Testament of Simeon, chapter 5, verse 3, please? Beware, therefore, of fornication, for fornication is the mother of all evils, separating from Alahayim and bringing near to Belier. Continue in Reuben 4 and 6, please. For a pit unto the soul is the sin of fornication, separating it from Elohim and bringing it near to idols, because it deceiveth the mind and understanding and leadeth young men into hate before their time. The spirit of fornication is mother of all evils, separating from Elohim and bringing near to Belier and idols by deceiving our mind and understanding to cause us to listen to idols with the result of it causing all evil in that idolatry when we do their works, leading us to our death in life and then again in the judgment. This is a result of spiritual fornication and idolatry and the scriptures confirm Elohim, who is a spirit himself, sees things spiritually, viewing idolatry as fornication as well. To know we are getting understanding in the spiritual things today, to have insight and the right perspective of spiritual fornication and idolatry. Uh, Jeremiah 3 and 6, please. Ahiah said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She hath gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. All right, so Elohim, the spiritual one, looks at these things in spirit. Whatever she, backsliding Israel, went into the mountain and under the trees to do is playing the harlot to Elohim. Let's see what she did. Jeremiah 3 and 9, please. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Harlotry and whoredom of this woman was in her idolatry serving other spirits that dwell in mountains or in the waysides or in stones and stocks of wood, confirming that Worshipping other entities beside the Alahayim head, which is the father, Ahaya, the son, Yache, and the mother, Ruach Akwadoshi, the Holy Spirit. Besides those that comprise the Alahayim head, the three that bear witness, worshipping other entities outside of them is spiritually fornicating, and now we see it's committing adultery too in the sight of our Maker. The Hebrew language confirms what we are understanding. When we look at the word for harlot out of these verses in H2181, we're going to get the definitions that we need out of this. It means 
to commit adultery, figuratively to commit idolatry, cause to commit fornication or commit fornication. And the Browns Briggs is to be unfaithful to Allah Hayyam, figuratively. Idolatry, being unfaithful to Allah Hayyam, is playing the harlot, committing fornication and adultery in spirit in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And Jeremiah 3 and 9 confirmed it so we can know harlotry to commit spiritual fornication, to worship idols, to do wrong according to the law is considered adultery as well in spirit. The Hebrew definition of adultery helps confirm idolatry is adultery spiritually as well. In uh, H5003, the word for adultery out of the verses we read in Jeremiah the Browns break definition is to commit adultery, idolatrous worship figuratively. So this helps understand idolatry is also figuratively fornication and adultery. So they go hand in hand to know an idolater is also a fornicator, an adulterer in spirit against the Lord who created him. And someone who struggles with the spirit of fornication and or committing adultery is also an idolater because one has to hearken to idols to be in those spirits and commit the transgressions being assisted by them. We're getting insight into the spirit of things to see that spiritual fornication is idolatry, committing adultery in the sight of Allah Hayyam, and that idolatry is the cause of all evil in the world. Uh, Anything before we continue? Yeah, on um, excuse me, on Jeremiah three and nine, it says, "And it came to pass through the lightness of a whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks." That's a very clear indicator when you're dealing with a religion that is um, idolatrous. Um, they, the world has really did a toll on us by separating religion from spirituality when every religion is spiritual because you're you're dealing with a spiritual being in every religion so it has to be spiritual there's no way you can separate religion and spirituality they go hand in hand and based off of the religion that you're following or the alahayim or the the spiritual entity that you're following that has a play on the works that you bring forth. And that lets you know spiritually who you're actually serving because the spiritual takes over and you actually do the works of the spiritual being that you're following or you take on the persona of the spiritual being that you're following. So you can actually see, like, as we continue going into this lesson and Kasifo explains different things, you'll get to see how when you see people in a religion just based off of your own perception, your own experiences, when you start seeing people in these other religions, you get to see how they operate and you get to see why they operate the way they operate. You'll start getting to understand because of the, the spiritual implication of the religion. And you'll get to actually see who they're actually serving through how they're operating and how they're working and how the religion is, 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 um, what is it built like how the religion what the religion is built on you actually get to see that through the people that actually are involved in the religion so it it, it all goes hand in hand amen that helps that when james said faith is shown by works that's applied to any deity whomever we trust in or have faith in the works is going to be shown towards them Because you're going to start taking on the persona of that deity that you're worshiping. Like, every religion is spiritual. Like, you can't just say, I'm spiritual. No, there's a religion that goes with your spirituality because every idol has certain things that you must do to serve them, which makes a religion. So it just depends on what religion you fall into. You may not want to categorize your religion, but based off what entity you're serving 
there's going to be a religion that's going to coincide with what you're saying, though you may not want to categorize yourself with it. So it, it really it really makes us have to see ourselves and see who we're actually serving. Amen. Thank you for that. Amen. With that, now we'll look at a work in the flesh, adultery, to see more scriptures to help understand that adultery is also more than idolatrous worship or infidelity in a marriage in the sight of Allah Hayyam and his angels. What is adultery? Can you read Hermas Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 9, please? Not only saith he, is it adultery if a man pollute his flesh? But whosoever doeth things like unto the heathen committeth adultery. Polluting the flesh to have intimacy with someone that is not your lawful spouse is adultery, for sure. Yet, also, polluting the flesh with the spirit of fornication to sin against the law is adultery too, because the body wasn't made for the spirit of fornication. And that's shown in the fact that the law says not to covet. And if I look at a woman to lust after her, I have coveted breaking the law by the spirit of fornication withdrawing me from the law unto idols, which Allah Hayyam looks at as me committing adultery in my heart. My thought and my desire being in fornication to do evil against the law puts me into adultery in the sight of Allah Hayyam because I sinned against him and in my thoughts and desires is where spiritual fornication starts. Now, how can we confirm that sinning in general is also committing adultery in the sight of Allah Hayyam? Can you continue that verse, that second part, please? But whosoever doeth things like unto the heathen commit for adultery. This is important here. The angel of repentance who was speaking showed what physical adultery is in the flesh and also adultery in the spirit. When he says, whosoever does things like unto the heathen is committed adultery, because the heathen, they worship and serve idols, which is spiritual fornication causing them to do all the evil they do against the law of Allah Hayyam. To Allah Haim and his angels, the act of sinning like the heathen is committing adultery too. So if we do anything like they, the unbelieving nations do, it would be evil in transgressing. So it helps us understand adultery in spirit is also sinning or doing evil in general, if you will. Not just unlawful intercourse to pollute our flesh, mind you. Scriptures show following the heathen to do like they do actually pollute with idols too to know servant idols to sin against the law like an unbeliever pollutes us can you read ezekiel 23 and 30 please i would do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols so how ahia sees it is we go into spiritual fornication to go a whoring after the heathen and getting defiled with their idols at work in us to sin in thought or words or deeds. So, thus far, adultery pollutes the flesh by idols to sin and fornication is a sin against our own body by reason of the pollution of it in transgression. Understanding spiritual fornication is the idolatrous practices of the heathen to do evil according to the vain doctrines of their idols or the vain customs we create to serve our own idols of our own hearts helps understand adultery is not merely polluting your flesh in unlawful intimacy, but also polluting the flesh with idols. In summary, truly, Adultery is a product of spiritual fornication polluting our flesh with idols that cause us to walk in the lust of the flesh to do evil things like the heathen, transgressing the law of Allah Hayyam. This hopefully helps understand spiritual fornication and committing adultery is simply sinning against the law of Allah Hayyam and his ways as unbelievers do.
Anything before I continue? No, you can continue. Thank hey. you. You're welcome. Now, let's get into understanding fornication and the effects of it. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, please? Leave fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Doing any act of the spirit of fornication actually is a sin against our own body. Why so? Continue verse 13, please. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Because the body is for the Lord, its maker. That's why any act of fornication is actually a sin against our own body. It says, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Because our vessel, our vessel is made for the Lord. And if we have fornication dwelling in our vessel, which our fornication actually causes us to depart from Elohim, then our body is not useful for Elohim because he can't dwell in it to operate in it. So this is why fornication is so key. It's so important for us to understand because if fornication is dwelling in our body, then our body isn't holy. And if our body isn't holy, then Elohim can't dwell in it. So this is why when Kassas explaining, said now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Because our vessel is supposed to be holy unto Elohim. And we're supposed to have the good spirits of Elohim dwelling in our body. And fornication, the pernicious spirit that it is, it's like a cancer and it starts going off into everything. It starts spreading. And if fornication is in the body, then the body's not going to be able to be holy. So you can actually understand why Elohim is saying what he's saying. You ain't telling no story. She's literally a sickness. We're going to touch on that here shortly. So it makes sense. And Elohim's spirit in uh, Shepherd of Hermes, it talks about the spirit Elohim gave is holy and true. And, and we ought to not have any complicity with evil. So like to know, like we really have to be purified for Elohim to dwell in us as he is pure. So thank you. I think I'm gonna find the scripture just to reference it. Sorry. Um we go second Timothy two and twenty one. It says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel. Oh, and of course it's talking about idols. Uh um should I start further right now? Right, okay. Yeah, I think I'm about to go back a little bit. Um, Second Timothy 2 and 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, we're going to understand why he wants everybody who name is the name of Yahweh Christ to depart from iniquity but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth so he's talking about idols in a great house idols are there and some to honor and some to dishonor because some are made to just be vessels like it's just for your use for your day to day or um, doesn't have to do with an idol but the ones that are made to be as an idol are dishonored, right? If a man therefore purge himself from these, we're talking about we're talking about fornication, we're talking about idolatry. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So we have to be a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. And with fornication being in our dwelling place, we can't. So this is why we have to truly understand fornication and stand aloof from it.
You got to read that next verse then. Okay. Because <laughs> he, he is exactly what he's talking about. Right. Um, 2 Timothy 2 and 22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So he's telling you what spirits that he actually wants to dwell in us and not in this case fornication that we're talking about right now so puts it in perspective here we are talking about one of the sins of youth fornication the main one to overcome mm -hmm. so we may be meat for Allah Hayyam's use and Adonai eh? or the Lord Yahweh's use thank you praise Allah for that mm -hmm. Now, in continuing understanding that fornication is a sin against our body, this also holds true when Allah brings a man and a woman together in marriage, that they become one body and they twain are for him, not fornication. Can you read 1 Corinthians 11 and 11, please? Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Let me see. They're one in the Lord. Matthew 19 and 6, please. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore Elohim have joined together, let not man put us under. He binds them together in spirit. So carnal things, carnal spirits ought not to separate them. Seeing as though fornication isn't for our body, it's a sin against ourselves and our spouse, who is our flesh and bone, to commit its works, since our body is truly for the Lord and Christ, has no concord with Belier, nor Allahayim with idols, and in respect of marriage, the Lord joins a man and his wife together as one spirit and flesh to agree together. So they are one spirit and body for the Lord. Because a man and woman married in Christ, agree with Christ and Allah, Hayim, the spirit of fornication brings division between them in body and spirit, since they also have no conquer with Belier, respectively, in the same mind of Christ as believers. Fornication can really cause a rift in relationships, whether it's with the Lord, that personal relationship with him, or with one another, whether it be with a spouse, whether it be with a brother or sister, or anyone in general. From the faith and obedience to Christ aspect, we have to understand fornication really affects our health and bodily functions from upholding the faith as well. Can you read Acts of Thomas chapter 27, please? For fornication blinds the mind and darkens the eyes of the soul, and it's an obstruction to life, conversation of the body, making the whole man weak and casting his whole body into sickness. Well, he says it's an obstruction to life, or conversation of the body. It obstructs our manner of living. Remember the mind, senses. The mind, body, and senses, we were made for Allah Hayyam. We were given our senses and our bodies to keep his law. Fornication obstructs that. It obstructs from the life Allah Hayyam gave in his commandments to be long-suffering and humble and so on and so forth. We see through scripture, it affects our body, causes weakness in performing the laws, and sickness from the health in Ahaya, while blinding our mind and darkening our eyes to understand and depart from evils. It's like a disease affecting our health, being foreign to us, as it wasn't given to us from Allah Hayyam in our creation to do His will. So far, with what we are understanding to grow in mercy and long-suffering, we have to understand fornication isn't something to look down upon somebody for or get into our feelings about it or get offended because someone's struggling with the spirit of fornication or its works. Because in the spiritual, 
it is literally a terminal disease that if not cured, a person unfortunately will fade away in his dominion over them and eventually pass away in it in that second death to come at the judgment. So when we see ourselves or someone else in it, love with understanding and long suffering, according to the law of Allah in his word, that has to be implemented to heal us and help them heal from the struggle. From what Thomas said, fornication blinds the mind and darkens the eyes, weakening us from having understanding to see right and having strength to do what's right as we were created to do. Being an obstruction to life in the humility and long suffering of the commandments, like a blockage in our system, obstructing the conversation or manner of living of our body to operate rightly as our body is meant to in the law and the fruits. So that our mind, eyes, and body would be operating in the lust of the flesh or the lust of fornication, where the mindset, outlook, mannerisms, and works of the spirit of fornication can be seen in us. No understanding or holiness is in her, speaking of fornication, herself. So when the spirit is in our minds, eyes, and or bodies having an effect on us, we will lack understanding and holiness with jealousy at work and lust, just like her, because when this spirit is working in us, it leads us away from Allah so that our mind, body, and senses may not be useful to the Lord who it was created for. So hopefully this helps understand when we continue in doing evil, it's the illness of fornication and idolatry as some spirit still has sway to assist and cause us to keep doing evil because of some pleasure we have or the deceit that is being used to seduce and blind us to give our mind over to the passion to act on the evil. This is just for knowing the truth to be honest with ourselves and start looking into what may be causing us to go astray from Allah in our minds. It's important because it's the spirit of fornication drawing us away in our minds to draw us near to the devil to do all this evil we've done or we are doing or we seeing done in the world and it leads us to works of witchcraft. We know the spirit of fornication is mother of all evil and the devil is the father of lies separating us from Allah and this spirit of fornication helps cause us to sin in various ways listening to her children the evil spirits. She is not only literally getting us to commit fornication by some intimate act as we already seen how idolatry itself listening to other spirits and acting according to them is spiritual fornication causing men to make idols or unlawful images to worship them or to sin and commit all manner of transgression to corrupt us destroy us and shed blood on the earth so when in the spirit of fornication a person is not limited to just sleeping around or being promiscuous, or carrying themselves with a lack of modesty and shamefacedness, or struggling with pride, as fornication teaches arrogance. But really, when in the spirit of fornication, we're liable to transgress and sin against Allah and His commandments in various ways, as the spirit of fornication herself has no understanding to depart from evil, or holiness to obey the word of Allah So she leads us into the same direction and this is why it's so important for us to know and learn the law and be familiar with the works of the fruits of the spirit so we can have that knowledge of the doctrine of life and apply to do good things that please Allah which separates us from fornication the devil and other idols it's essential to implement practice investigate concerning the deity Put his laws into place and see what they do. See the fruits of it to build faith. Because humility, it takes humility to keep the law. That casts out envy.
and envy was the reason death came into the world because of the devil. And then it takes righteousness to cast out hatred. Hatred is at work. She's one of the 12 evil women. She's at work in all the works of the devil and fornication and such. So it's not possible to overcome without actually implementing and doing and taking action to show our faith in Allah and by our works. Anything? Yes. You know me, I like to make things as simple as possible so that things can make sense. Um, you have on the one dichotomy, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into men and makes men friends and prophets of Allah. Then on the other dichotomy, you have fornication, the mother of all evil. She's just like the Holy Spirit, except she's evil. So if fornication comes into you, she's going to make you a friend or a prophet to the devil. And she's going to control you. She's going to make you do her works because she comes into you and lowers you. Just like Brother Kafifo said, she leads you. So you can actually get a clear dichotomy of, okay, if a spirit comes into me and leads me to fulfill my lust of desires, I know that that's the wrong mother. If the mother comes and she torments me with her discipline to make sure I'm abstaining from evil and that I'm implementing righteous and good works, now I know that's the right mother. So we have to understand and choose our family like this is the whole thing about what's going on the whole spiritual the whole spiritual war is between two sides two families you have the father you have his son you have the mother his wife right that's a family you have the daughters the virgins that's his family you want to be a partaker with that family and have all the good qualities of that family in you. Now, on the other dichotomy, you have another family. You have the devil. You have his son, and you also have the mother, fornication. And you have all his children. You have the children of the devil, the women in black. You have his daughters. And you also have all their offsprings from all the evil spirits and demons what which are a part of his family so you have to understand what family and make a choice of what family you want to be a part of and by making that choice you have to bring forth the works of the choice that you're making so just to understand you you see a clear dichotomy of how the two mothers work they both lead you they both can take over and make you do a work. It's just whether or not it's a good or a bad work. If it's going to lead unto sin or it's going to lead unto righteousness. So like, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but it just so we can initiate it real quick so that we can start thinking about it. Like, okay, that makes sense. And in the next discussion, we're going to discuss the devil and his family, actually, Lord willing. So we're going to touch on the major children to watch out for. Because if we keep from those major ones, we'll be better equipped to abstain from the rest. Amen. In all this, let's understand fornication more in depth. Reuben 7 and 4, please. For in fornication... There is neither understanding nor holiness. Remember, to depart from evil is understanding according to Job 28, 28. So the spirit of fornication, she won't depart from evil, but rather causes all of it, just as Zach was talking about, since she doesn't have understanding from Allah herself. Also, the commandments and laws are holy, as Paul said in Romans 7 and 13, 
So that holiness of the law and commandments is not relevant with the spirit of fornication to do them. Continue, please. And all jealousy dwelleth in the lust thereof. She is a lustful spirit herself. And every type of jealousy is in her lust, all of which helps her to have no understanding nor holiness to depart from evil and have the holy law and commandments dwelling in her to do them. This means in short, when struggling with fornication, it's a struggle to understand what's evil outlined in the law and or to depart from the evil to be holy by keeping the law and or getting jealous of others in various ways, being in competition with others. And if I find myself to still be struggling, then that's a truth I have to own up to and take accountability for, being honest that I haven't overcome the spirit of fornication and its works yet to Allah Hayim, and pray for the help and get understanding going to his counselors he appointed to help me come out of the struggle. It's important to be honest with ourselves about it because we... That's the truth we need. We need the truth. Yache spake on John, in the book of John, he said, those that, John 3 and 21 says, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in Allah Hayyam. I have to be honest to come to Allah Hayyam and tell the truth so that I can learn the actual truth and correct the things that I have wrong so that my deeds will be manifest that they're actually wrought in Allah because I'm honest and I'm actually coming toward his light so that the darkness can be exposed and purged. But on the other hand, if I have pleasure in what I'm doing or I have the vain glory of not wanting to be who I really am or see who I really am, It's going to mess me up because John 3 and 19 says, For this is condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So because of my pleasure in evil, I'll be more inclined to have pleasure in the darkness, not one to come to the light to tell the truth, be honest with myself, or go to the counselor to get counsel because it would just reprove my deeds. Verse 20 for every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That pleasure in it keeps us where we are so that we don't be corrected. And we stay doing the evil and won't seek the light because that's just going to show us what we're actually doing. And fornication doesn't want to hear that. And that pleasure in us does want to hear it so we can know how important it is to be honest with ourselves and with our counselor. We're not saying go open your heart to every man. The scriptures tells you not to do that. But go speak to that counselor that keeps the command and tell what's really going on so you can speak on what that demon is doing. Zach, while well, you spoke on in the last discussion about you got to call it out so that the demon doesn't have place. You got to speak the truth on it. So that's essential to do. Did you have anything before I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Um, there's three stages, so to speak. Um, you're hot, you're lukewarm, or you're cold. And those three stages come with a certain level of understanding, right? If you're hot, that means that you don't have any, you don't have any temperance. And when fornication comes, you're going to be quickly given over to it. There's not going to be much of a, a battle. You're just going to fulfill the, the lust of fornication, right? That's where many people are. They're hot, right? Now, lukewarm means that you've gotten some understanding. So now you're like, okay, I know fornication is wrong. I know just being intemperate is wrong and just giving myself over to something is wrong. Now, in the lukewarm stage, that's when you're going to run into many different obstacles of trying to keep the law 
and also fulfill your lust in, in, in fornication. So you may fall into situations where you may try to find a way to fulfill your lust and keep the commandment, which doesn't work because it's a contradiction. Um, or you're going to find yourself knowing that it's wrong and fighting against it and, and maybe getting the victory sometimes, maybe not, because you still have that desire for fornication or whatever lust it is that you're trying to accomplish. Right. So then that would be the lukewarm stage. The lukewarm stage is tough because you're fighting. You have two spiritual entities pulling you back and forth. All right. You have the you have the angel of righteousness trying to help you, the angel of wickedness trying to pull you away. You also have the Holy Spirit trying to teach you. And you also have the mother of fornication trying to lure you. All right. So being lukewarm is harder. Okay. Now, when you're cold, you don't make any excuses. You don't try to find a way around something to fulfill something. You stand on the law. You stand on what's right, according to Allah and what's righteous, and you don't depart from it. And that's being cold. You're not quickly moved, and you're not easily moved. All right? And you understand what's right and what's wrong. Like, I'm not going to try to find a way to fulfill something through the law. Trying to find a gap in the law to do what I want to do. Because that's the lukewarm stage. So when I'm cold, I'm standing on what Allah says. And I've ridded myself from that desire to be able to lead me. All right. So now we, we have those three stages. Now, of course, you need to understand what stage you're in so that then you can actually do what's needful to come out of whatever stage it is so that you can actually grow, All right? So just understanding that. Mm, that's essential. Thank you. Praise Allah for that. Amen. It's essential to see that the... um the process we have to go through to get to the place where we got the experience in to finally get cold to where we actually stand in to know it's 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 a must and it's essential for us to prepare our hearts and set our minds to go through that chastening to know okay this is where i am i'm right here right now that's great to know I have, that's a understanding. That's understanding I have now. Now, let me work. Because I know it's no skipping steps with Allah. I, I got to go through the whole thing. It's not overnight, but I'm going to get there. And Paul was exhorting on this because he said in Hebrews 12 and 11, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. So it, it can seem grievous, but that comes with perspective. We can view it joyfully. We may not be there yet, but that's a work to get there where we view it with joy, knowing what we're headed towards. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We have to actually exercise in righteousness to get in shape in doing what's right to Allah Hayyam and having a right mind to Allah Hayyam to be strengthened. So hopefully that helps to set in our mind. Funny. Go ahead. <laughs> I said no chasing them for the present seems to be joyous. So when you get corrected in that moment, it's not joyous for many but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, so after the correction and time goes by, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby because you're continuing to move forward. It's going to come up and you're going to have to be like, you know what? That was true. Because if it's something that you have to learn or something that you have to grow in, there's no way you're going to get around it. Like, Nevertheless, afterward, 
it's still going to yield the peaceable fruit because it's something that you needed. It wasn't something that was an option for you. It was something that you actually needed for your growth. So, you know, how you have those moments, you'd be like, oh, such and such told me that. Like, yeah, it's one of those moments where you're like, you know what, oh, man, I should have just listened then. And I would have been able to move further, quicker, instead of dragging my feet or trying to cast it away from me. And once you see that casting things away from you doesn't bring forth fruit, and that actually receiving things and examining yourself actually bring forth fruit, you'll start to humble yourself. And that pride will actually start departing because it's the pride that makes things grievous because you actually take an injury. You take an injury because you don't want to be chastised or you don't want to be, um, you don't want the constructive criticism or you don't like to be told no in some instances. So it's actually the chastisement or the injury that actually causes you or the pride that actually causes you not to yield the fruit right away but a lot of times that fruit comes after because you may have to be humbled in a certain scenario for you to actually receive something good Casa. praise Allah for understanding now We kind of did a good little discussion about the necessary to do right and embrace correction and reproof and work to overcome fornication and being honest to overcome fornication. Now, on the other hand, unlike the disobedience to the law and fruits of the spirit and fornication, according to Psalms 145 verse 17, Ahaya is righteous in all his ways, which is how he operates or carries himself in good fruits. And also he is holy in all his works. So everything he actually does is in his holy law and commandments. That's just for a dichotomy of the two sides. It puts us right back to the hot or cold discussion. Allah Hayim is cold. Everything he does is holy. Everything he does is righteous. Fornication, everything she does is unholy. Everything she does is unrighteous. And we have and to cut right and hot. <laughs> we have to come out from her side all together. We gotta be one with Allah. Hayim. Can't serve two masters. When Allah Hayim's spirits are complete in us and no other spirits of the devil have place in us we will be doing all things righteously in the fruits and according to the holy manner of his law, sincerely, without hypocrisy or self-pleasing, just to do some things well and neglect others for our desire or pleasure's sake, seeking to preserve some of our own life or fulfill our own lusts. That's what we'll get to as we talked about in the last discussion about being single-faced, where it's literally about Allah Hayyam, what's right to him, what pleases him, and how we can do that. And that's what we're content to do. Now, continuing on fornication and the spirit that support the evil of their mother. You notice jealousy hangs with fornication dwelling in her lust. When she is at work, Jealousy dwells in her lust to bring us near to Belier by helping deceive us to darken our mind and blind our eyes from what's right on Talahayim. For understanding how jealousy helps fornication, jealousy itself doesn't suffer us to be sober of mind and moderate to our passions to do what's right to Talahayim, which is a perfect playing ground for lust and other evil spirits. So you can hopefully see how the spirits of lust, fornication, and jealousy work together to have us unstable and intemperate and unable to control ourselves to moderate our passions, to have our minds and senses subject to the law of Allah Hayim, so that 
desires can't keep us or get us into fornication. Now, let's get into understanding jealousy, if you don't have anything, Zachwa. No, go ahead. All right. Understanding jealousy. Let's read about what jealousy said about herself. Testament of Solomon, chapter 38, please. Likewise, also the fourth said, I cause men to forget their sobriety and moderation. I part them and split them into parties, for strife follows me hand in hand. So, see here how jealousy in the lust of fornication causes us to forget sober-mindedness and moderation of our desires and passions, opening us up to desires of the lust of the spirit of fornication, causing us to sin through listening and following these idols to obey them in our minds and operating in their works within our body. Now, also jealousy parts us and splits us with strife helping her. Yet, who are these spirits parting us and splitting us from? Where the spirits of Allah draw us together in love to bring us into one mind, spirit, doctrine, and body in unity, the devil and his spirits work together through lust of fornication, jealousy, and strife to draw us away from Allah and his family unto the devil. So you exactly what I talked about is plainly two sides. Jealousy has strife helping her to separate us from Allah Hayyam's side and get us into the devil and fornication side. Firstly, and then we see it manifest in, in the world in different parties and sect and religions and such. We got to be mindful of lust, jealousy, and fornication as they work in our mind and body and senses to turn us from Allah Hayyam's commands and the perfection of our faith in cheerfulness, mercy, patience, and long-suffering, as we learned in the mind, body, and senses lesson. For overcoming fornication, we have to touch on jealousy, as she is in the lust of fornication, helping to get us into the lust of fornication. So let's understand what she does a bit and what spirits assist her as well so that we can get a better grasp of what we need to keep away from the lust of fornication. <laughs> if you have anything, Zach, well, please go ahead. Okay. Um, we have two different things. I want to make sure that we know the dichotomy between jealousy and envy real quick. Jealousy is when you covet something that belongs to somebody else, but you don't necessarily want it. Envy is when you cover something that belongs to somebody else because you actually want it. Okay? So we get, we see right here that um, strife follows jealousy hand in hand. So when you are, when you're in fornication, right, you have jealousy that comes. So jealousy is like, you have something that I don't have. And then because of that you have something that I don't have. Now strife enters into your heart. Right? Now it's a problem that there's something that you have that I don't have. Now there's a problem. And now how that acts out, whether it be a child or an adult or whatever the case is, it'll act out differently. Maybe you have a problem with your father. Like, how come they have this and I don't? Or when it comes to your spouse, it's like, why are they getting that and I'm not? So you can actually see how fornication, jealousy, and strife actually work together and how it comes one after another. They all start working together right back to back. Because the fornication started it, the jealousy came in, and then the strife came in. It, it don't take, it, it's not like, it's not, I'm trying to give people a visual. It's not like, okay, fornication comes in. I'm like, yeah, I want that so bad, fornication. And then the next thing, it's like, well, after I got done fornicating, okay, now jealousy came. 
And now I'm like, well, I'm jealous now. And then it's like, well, I'm jealous. Okay, later on down the road, now strife comes. No, they're back to back to back. They all working at the same time. So fornication comes, boom, jealousy comes, boom, strife comes. And it's just that quick. And by the time all three of those things happen, more than likely you missed it. So this is why we have to learn about these things so that we can actually be on guard and vigilant for them when it comes to our soul. Because they're trying to enter into our heart so that they can lead us away through our heart's desires. But we have to be mindful of where we place our heart. Whether unto Allah or unto the devil. Alright, so this is why we're 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 going through these things. And praise Allah and Kasa doing an amazing job. We're going through these things so that everybody can get the understanding to then be vigilant and to be on guard against them, understanding them. Okay. Kasa, I'm with you, brother. Bless him. Don't miss that part that Zakwa mentioned that it's fast because hatred works with the devil through hastiness of spirit to fulfill all their works. So that essentialness of slowing down, taking the time to breathe and compose ourselves, it helps us actually be in the moment to see what's going on. Because it, it, it's like when you ain't telling no story, it really happens in an instant. Whoop, whoop, yeah. bam. Right. And for parents, of course, you need to understand this yourself, but you also need to understand this for your children. Because you're raising your children. If you don't understand the things that are against you or your children, how can you help your children to then come out of a cycle of something that you are not aware of or something that you're specific tribe of people are struggling with and then it ends up becoming what they call a um generational curse because nobody's getting the understanding of it to overcome it yeah yeah so praise Allah for that understanding Thank you. Now, we already saw strife works with jealousy. Let's learn more about the spirits that works with jealousy. Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 5, please. The sixth is the spirit of lying and perdition and jealousy to practice deceits and concealments from kindreds and friends. So lying is in the mix, too. Lion, the son of the devil, is with jealousy to practice deceit and concealment from loved ones. So being truthful and genuine and doing well to communicate helps overcome him and not give in to jealousy. Also, be mindful to always have love in our thoughts and not getting into jealousy as lying is with her. So getting jealous gets us into some kind of lie and we don't want to partake in that because all liars or those that love lies are going to partake in the second death okay entertaining love is important Reuben himself said it entertain love towards our neighbors that's important for overcoming fornication because she needs hatred to be in our hearts because hatred helps blind us you have the lesson love is a boundary for reference uh Zakwa. um when Alain talks about um contentment with holiness is great gain that actually keeps you away from the spirit of jealousy and it actually helps you with the spirit of fornication and it also will stop you from striving when Jacob said if Alheim gives me food and raiment, I'm content, and he will be my Alheim. We have to have that same mindset in being content with food and raiment. Because if we get into desiring anything else, 
it gets place for jealousy. It gets place for fornication. It gets place for strife. It gets place for lying. Just for not being content. Contentment with holiness is great game. But just for being not content, all of those other spirits have place. Because it's actually through coveting, which is the opposite of contentment, that actually gave place for all of these spirits. Because when fornication enters and jealousy enters and strife enters, you're going to lie because you want what you want. Fornication has already taken rule over you. Strife, and if I'm not mistaken, is it strife or malice and uh, lying go together? Or is it wrath and lying? Wrath. There it goes. I always get that one mixed up. So you can see how strife and wrath, they go hand in hand. So you can see how lying actually goes right with it. Because then you're going to conceal your true intent. Because the true intent doesn't sound good. Like, man, I just want it. I'm jealous because you have it. I don't necessarily want it because you have it, but I want something too. It may not be that, but I want something. And I'm going to cause the strife and I'm going to lie about my intent until I get it. That's if somebody was being very truthful and honest and understood what was going on, that's what they would say. So we have to be mindful and really examining ourselves and really, um, really practicing what is good and pleasing to Allah. We have to start working on our mindset just as Jacob did. If Allah gives me food and raiment, therewith I'm content. And he's going to be my Allah and I'm going to be his people. Like, we have to be at that mindset. But we don't need all of these things. I can, I can assure you, many of us that's sitting right here and listening to this lesson, have way more than what we need. And we're not lacking. And if you are lacking, I'm sure there's somebody here that will help you. Like, we are... We have learned from the world to be covetous. This is why our, our women struggle with shopping. Anytime they get into their emotions or something happens, they go and shop. It's a lack of contentment that throws you into a, a whirlwind of lack of contentment. And you can see it through the through the works. So men, when something happens to us or something or some mishap happens, we go off and we commit some sin in our downward spiral. Like, it's the same thing. The lack of contentment. Like, contentment is very important. Especially in this walk. Because it keeps us on the path. Nothing can allure us away. Fornication lures you away. Fornication only has a place when you desire something.
Like, if we don't have a desire outside of what Alahaya wants for us, fornication doesn't have a place. This is why I tell my children, don't set your heart upon anything unless Alahaya shows you that he's going to give it to you. Because if you set your heart upon something and Alahaya didn't say that it was for you, then you're going to fall. Because not all things that fall into your possession are for you. That's why it's very good to know if it is for you or not. Because some things may fall into your possession for you to be the be the, the middleman or the person that goes and gives it to who it needs to be given to. So just because it falls into your hand doesn't necessarily mean it's for you. So this is why we can't be moved to discuss or to delight. We have to always be mindful, okay, Allah, I am this for me. Is this what you want for me? So that we can always be temperate. We can always be um, content. Because that's going to keep us away from evil. We would always be sober too and moderate. I'm glad you mm -hmm. came in. You go ahead and take over. Mm -hmm. Praise Allah for that because it puts us in understanding of how Yache overcame when he came into the flesh. He had one delight in Psalms 40 and 8. I delight to do thy will, O my Allah. Yea. Thy law is within my heart. The word delight is to take pleasure in, desire, be pleased with. As Zach was saying, fornication can't have place if that's the only thing we're pleased with, is to do Allah will, or the only thing we desire. But once these spirits see another inclination, another pleasure, Another desire. Here they come. Mm -hmm. well, I am told Adam, when Adam had to leave the garden, he said, if you keep your soul from all evil as one about to die, he shall have the tree of life to eat from it. In being in the moment, sobering down and simplifying life, every moment, every opportunity is life or death. Because yeah. just as when we die, the holy angels and the evil spirits are right there to see who has place in us. So take the moment in life now and understand they're here to see who has place in us. And let's put the work in to conform ourselves from wherever we are right now, today, while it's called today. Let's take a moment, sit down and reason and, okay, start putting the work in to get cold. Well, perfect. I'm calling this if someone, if you happen to be cold already, praise Allah. Perfect it. Keep it. Mm -hmm. Gotta get to where we're inclined to Allah. will. That's what we've been to. That's what we yield ourselves to, to bring forth fruits of righteousness. And it's what truly pleases us. Wholeheartedly. Let's can if you didn't have anything on this, Aqua. Oh, okay. Right, Let's continue looking at the spirits that work with jealousy. Simeon chapter two, verse six, please. 
For in the time of my youth, I was jealous in many things of Joseph. <clears throat> because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him. Because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind. So that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Jacob my father. The devil, the prince of deceit and father of lies. Just as we saw in Jubilees, when we read Jubilees 11 in the last lesson, he sends spirits to get us to fall. He sent jealousy to cause Simeon to forget sobriety and moderation. And in that spiritual fornication, he departed from Malahayim and his law to be arrogant, seeking vain glory of being loved more than his brothers, then envying his brother because he was loved and giving in to anger to treat his brother as an enemy and lack compassion for his father in the lust of fornication because fornication doesn't suffer one to have compassion on their neighbor and also hatred of heart because hatred doesn't suffer one to hear the commandments concerning love. So you see how Zach would say, it don't take no time. It's, whoop, whoop, they're in there. It's a gang thing. Okay. So it wasn't jealousy alone that caused Simeon to fall, though. From what befell Dan, because him and Dan fell to the same thing, essentially. We can look at it. And it sheds light that the spirit of vain glory helps jealousy to get us into such thoughts and feel in jealousy, anger, and hatred. Can you read Testament of Dan chapter 1 verse 5, please? And I rejoice that he was sold because his father loved him more than us. So he had some bad-minded outlook as Simeon so we can know the same spirits got him too. All right, continue, please. Did you ever notice that Dan disassociated himself? No. He said, and I rejoice that he was so because his father loved him more than us. He definitely. He disassociated himself. That's how you know the love was gone. It was like, that's not my father anymore. It's his father. Like he, he loves him more than us. They're together. He put both of them together. Hmm. He shrunk that anger and hatred. That's why he didn't anger. regard his father. Because he put them both together. They weren't for his turn. So since they were both against him, because they weren't giving him what he wanted, through his jealousy or envy, I would more so say. I don't even know if Dan wanted to be loved more than anyone else. So I would just have to say jealousy because it, it he yeah. never, there was never any record that he expressed that he desired it. He was just mad that Joseph was getting it. So, and even here, it looks like we're about to go into jealousy. Um, yeah, he just completely disassociated himself and was just jealous. And then the strife and the lion um, came in with the fornication. It looks like along with anger for Dan, you know, each different tribes have different spirits that have more of an effect on them. Look like vainglory was being cut. That's some vainglory type thing where it disassociates with whomever is not giving it what it wants. Mm -hmm. Hence, my father isn't giving me the love I want, so I'm done with him. And my brother's getting the love which I was supposed to get because I am also his son. So I'm done with him too. Sounds about right. It's unfortunate. But good for understanding for whomever the children of Dan are and whomever may be struggling with jealousy, anger, wrath, so and so. Be mindful of vainglory too, as it is no light part of what's going on. If you read verse 6, please. For the spirit of jealousy and vainglory said to me, Thou thyself also art his son. Two spirits telling him the same thing. 
so you can know you hear that stuff repeating in your mind them thoughts coming back over and over that's not a lie okay that'll stir you up yeah it's like like for this it's like entitlement the vainglory and jealousy brought forth entitlement so it's like thou thyself also are his son like he's showing him all this love but you are his son too like and then it starts making him have that negative mindset toward Jacob and Joseph Like, both of y'all aren't treating me right. You're not treating me right as a father. Really, it looked like it was just more so geared to his father. Like, you're not treating me right. right. In this one instant, thou thyself also art his son. It's unfortunate because it seemed like it was more towards his father and why even when Joseph was already sold, he was so bent on keeping that thing going. Like, yeah, let's throw some blood in the, the lie came. Let's throw some blood on the jacket and we'll do that. This is what we'll do. Because we want to get a reaction, get get back at Jacob. Mm -hmm. He was in the struggle. Praise Allah, he gave his testimony to help understand so that his children don't make the same decisions. Or they can understand when they see it happening. Like, hold on. I empathize with him, quite, and now, I, now I'm understanding why he spake on his children and Levi will be sinning together. The vainglory is a common trait, the pride. Oh, he took an injury. He took an injury, and because of the vainglory, it 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 it, it made him take the injury. Cause humility wouldn't take an injury. It's only through the vainglory and pride that actually causes a person to take an injury. If he would have been humble and said, "You know, okay, my father loves him," you know, but why does my father love him? Like. That would have been the humble route to say, okay, what quality does he show that makes my father love him so much? Maybe I need to implement those good qualities and make some changes. That's humility. Pride doesn't go that way. Vainglory does not go that way. Good for perspective for us today, though. Hopefully all this, well, it says you get to see it. the things we're going through. People have gone through it and they've overcome it. And we see they started with being honest with themselves and with others. Okay. And they went through the processes they needed to, to get over the things that they were actually able to be honest with themselves about that they struggled with. Now, getting back into seeing how these spirits work together, you see how spirits actually talk to us and give us inclinations. And then wrath is at work to get us provoked by the words we hear to have place and aid us in lawlessness. So you see, after Dan, he got told he's also his son, wrath gets him stirred up to get lifted up and get him to act. And aids him to do the wrong thing. The difference in Simeon and Dan was just that jealousy and envy was what Simeon had pleasure in, in his mind to be given over to everything else. While for Dan, wrath and anger, and also vainglory, was his struggle, which would give him over to the jealousy and etc. So the core struggle may be different for folks, respectively. But all in all, the different spirits will start working together 
to get us into the same place of falling by the spirit of fornication at work, in either case, to withdraw us from Malahayim. That's why we have to be diligent as to what we hear and what we incline unto, to not let it affect our mood or mindset or perspective or perception of how we are seeing or hearing something. You got to really be attentive to yourself. Like, hopefully, at this point, you know when something got you in your feelings. Or you know when you're in your feelings. To be honest, like, hold on, I'm not settled. I need a moment to recoup. And take the moment. Because if you don't take that moment, or if you ignore that inclination that you're not settled, you're going to go and fall more times than not. Because you didn't stop that first uh, breach. You didn't stop that first breach of the spirit. You got to close that gate so that you can actually function properly. Well, no, that's what any inclination. Any inclination that comes to your mind or whatever the case is, you got to stop it. Because if you don't, it's going to enter into your heart and then it's going to bring forth fruit. You can take your cuff and finish. Hey. Usually, jealousy is at work with vainglory helping it. Whenever someone is actually prospering or getting something we desire, like Simeon and Dan, this is why there's nothing in the commandments about first places of glory, because that desire of vain glory was how the devil fell from the beginning, and fornication teaches that arrogance to us to bring us unto the devil. So you, you see how if they didn't desire the first place of glory, the devil wouldn't have been able to get them. All right. So if we have any desire of being held in honor or getting glory from anyone, it's not the right inclination because it's fornication teaching to open us up to other spirits which darken and blind us to have a false perception of ourselves and others. This happened to the sons of Jacob as jealousy works with vain glory to be jealous of someone else's prosperity for getting moderation and sobriety, not to seek glory or first places ourselves being content with Allah and his will to see all things as good. Can you read Testament of Gad, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, please? I confess now my sin, my children, that oftentimes I wish to kill him because I hated him from my heart. Moreover, I hated him yet more for his dreams, and I wished to lick him out of the land of the living, even as an ox licketh up the grass of the field. Now Gad, his core struggle was hatred. Yet the spirit of fornication arrayed against him for his fall too, since hatred of heart leads to envy of a brother, to be blinded in anger. You can tell the spirit of fornication was behind the work because Gad hated Joseph, not only because of his glory and his dreams, but because he corrected him and fornication resents the words of holiness. Can you read Testament of Gad chapter 1 verse 8, please? And regarding this matter, I was wroth with Joseph until the day that he was sold, and the spirit of hatred was in me. And I wished not either to hear of Joseph with the ears or see him with the eyes, because he rebuked us to our faces, saying that we were eaten of the flock without Judah. And whatsoever things he told our father, he believed him. So he hated him for correcting him and the fact that his father loved him more and would believe whatever he said. Mind you, jealousy was at work in all this dwelling in the lust of fornication. So Gad admonished about staying away from her too, to help come out of hatred and other spirits through love and righteousness. So it's interesting. We see right here that 
Gad, and anybody that may struggle with any type of constructive criticism from another person, um, being corrected by another person, or being told no from a person, this is a great time to actually pay attention and learn and listen. Um, right here, we have an example. When Joseph corrected Gad, and I forgot who else it was. Um, it was Gad and who else? Casa, you remember? It was the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah that did it. So it was Naphtali, Dan, Gad, and Asher together. I remember in the testimony, he right. said that they had ate it without Judah. And right. the reason, and then they gave the reasoning why they did it. Right. Right? Now, Joseph, did Joseph do wrong? Joseph didn't do wrong. He didn't say that they were wrong for eating it. He said they were wrong because they ate it without Judah, which was right. Now, what they expressed was that because it was about to die, they go ahead and they ate it, which they justified their action, but yet they still never took accountability that Judah should have been involved. And that's what Joseph rebuked them for. So you see that instead of taking the rebuke and saying, you know what? Yeah, we didn't have Judah there. And we we could have done that. that. That's something that we could have, we can correct it. Instead, they took an injury or he took an injury and ended up going into a downward spiral and never coming out of the downward spiral. So we get to actually see Gad take an injury and how he dealt with that injury based off the spirits that he was struggling with ended up causing him to go into a downward spiral and going into uh, a pretty much what we would call a, a narcissistic collapse and narcissistic rage where he was unable to regather himself because of what happened by him being corrected. So if anybody struggles with anything of that nature, it'll be very wise to pay attention as we go through Gad to kind of see what transpired with Gad and what actually helped Gad because that is very important. We have to be able to take a criticism we have to be able to take constructive criticism. I mean, we have to be able to take no. Because what happens is through our self-will and our pride, we actually set our heart upon things before Elohim has actually said that it's something that was for us. And by doing that, it ends up causing you. When you do hear a no, you end up going into a downward spiral. And you end up going into wrath with lying. Because you wanted what you wanted, and it was prohibited from you. So you get angry. And we have to understand that so that we can stay away from it. As we see how it befell God. From the story, it was the sons of Zilpah. And Bilhah. That. But you see, everybody took it differently. So we get to really see what Gad was actually dealing with. Hmm. What was that in? Just so everybody can reference it. What you sent me. Oh, this is the... Testament of Gad, chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, or 6 to 9, if you will. Okay. So if anybody wants to go back over the story of what happened between Gad and, and um his brothers and not involving Judah uh, with the flock, then you can go back and check that out. Thank you for that. Um, and continuing building the understanding that 
Jealousy is at work in all that be going on in the lust of fornication. So God admonished us about staying away from her too, to help come out of hatred and other spirits through love and righteousness. Can you read Testament of God, chapter 7, verse 1, please? Okay. If a man prospereth more than you, do not be vexed, but pray also for him that he may have perfect prosperity. Zach, I talked about how lust pulls, fornication pulls. Where he said, don't be vexed, that's to keep you away from that pull of lust. The vexation of wrath to get us in our feelings to be in that jealousy and then getting the loss of fornication. We got to be at peace with everything, taking everything as good from Allah. And being content. Yeah. See somebody being prospered, entertain love, be happy for them. Pray Allah and prosper them more. Mm -hmm. through Gad's repentance he learned that not getting vexed is the right way to respond to Joseph's glory in his dreams and praying that he be prospered was the right way to respond as well continue please but so is it expedient for you and if he be further exalted be not envious of him. Remember that all flesh shall die, and offer praise to Allah who giveth things good and profitable to all men. So remember, there's nothing about glory or first places with Allah All flesh shall die. Don't be envious of the person, and praise Allah for what he's given, because it's it's from him. Take it as all good from him, whatever a person has, or have a person may be prospered. So remember, we are all flesh, and the lion gives what is good and profitable to whom he wills. So seeing someone prospered is praiseworthy to Allah, not something to get envious about, since Allah saw it was good and profitable for that person. For we know that Allah gives glory to a man if it is expedient for him. All right. Continue, please. Seek out the judgments of the Lord and thy mind will rest and be at peace. Fornication, lust, and jealousy is at work to take away sobriety and moderation, darken the mind, and withdraw from the law. So seeking out the law to cleave to it will bring peace in the mind, not to be given over to them. Um, If a man prospers more than you, right, and it's not by evil means, you have to you have to have the understanding that we're all working for Allah. Like if Allah made it expedient for that man to have glory, it's for the purpose of Allah glory. And if you're looking at it like they can't prosper more than you, then that shows that within you, your heart's not sincere toward Allah. Because Let's say for me, right? Allah has me preaching the gospel. If another man comes and preaches the gospel, and whether that man comes for strife, if he's preaching the gospel for strife, or if he's preaching it for love, the gospel is preached. Either way, it's fine with me. Because I'm doing my portion. What Allah has another man doing, that's the portion that Allah has for that man. I can't be covetous of another man's portion. So if I have that problem and I see someone profiting more than me and I get vexed, I have to look within myself and work out some things within my heart and my relationship with Allah Hayyam.
All right, Kath, I'm ready. Thank you for that. It's important. Being content with what Allah has given and perfecting whatever lot we have in the ministry and in the faith. And no matter how small it may seem, it's all important. Sorry. Yes, it is. But some people, just by you putting the work into change, you're professing the gospel, you're preaching by your works. So Now, we saw, we talked about when a person is prospering through righteousness and Allah gives them glory for his sake. Now, even when we see people getting rich through unrighteousness, on the other hand, we still have to avoid jealousy as it's not justification to sit ourselves. Continue in verse 4, please. And though a man become rich by evil means, even as Esau, the brother of my father, be not jealous, but wait for the end of the Lord. For if he taketh away from a man wealth gotten by evil means, he forgiveth him if he repent. So some folks that are wealthy by evil means will fall on hard times for the sake of them to come to repentance. Okay. Continue, please. But the unrepentant is reserved for eternal punishment. Unfortunately for some, it doesn't come to mind that it's because of how they went about getting well that they fall into hard times and they don't repent from the evil of their desires or the evil of their doings, so they fall away through the pleasure of the evil. Jealousy and envy is something important to focus on, not only because if we can stay out of it, we won't be able to fall into the lust of fornication, but also, whether rich or poor, if we're free from envy and jealousy, we can please the Lord, which is more profitable than any wealth or any glory we can have in this world, because we have the true treasure and substance that comes from Allah Hayyam in the spirit of Christ dwelling in us. Continue, please. For the poor man, if free from envy, he pleaseth the Lord in all things, is blessed beyond all men, because he hath not the travail of vain men. Amen. That content mindset of the blessing of pleasing Allah in all things through the spirit of Christ in us, being content with our food and our clothing and doing righteousness to be holy, keeps us from the travail of this world in vanity of desiring glory and wealth from the world or of the world. Being desirous for that law and the will of Allah and hopefully we see how important this is and understand why Gad was harping on this thing. Continue, please. Put away, therefore, jealousy from your souls and love one another with uprightness of heart. Through love with uprightness, seeking out Allah Hayyam's word and everything, we can keep from the wrong spirits. And it's hopefully understandable how important it is to work to put away jealousy from our souls because she really is a catalyst to get us into the lust of fornication whether it be in hatred of heart vainglory envy wrath which is emotional or struggles with passions and feelings struggle with anger and or other children of the spirit of fornication. There's something that came to mind here before continuing on overcoming jealousy. It said, the poor man, if he, if free from envy, he pleaseth the Lord in all things and is blessed beyond all men because he hath not the travail of vain men. He's blessed as well because being free from envy 
and pleasing the Lord, he's actually gaining wealth in spirit. He's gaining wealth in the kingdom to come. Uh, Zach, well, we talked about lukewarm and being hot or cold, right? Mm -hmm. Yache also spake on true wealth that comes from Alahayim when you're on the cold side in Revelation um, 3 and 18. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyesal that thou mayest see. So he wants us to come on his side and buy the gold that actually comes of him by being tried in the fire to do what's right. That we may actually be rich unto him, rich in good works, rich in faith, you know, rich in spiritual things. Instead of seeking the glory of this world, where the devil offers the wealth of this world. If we would partake in the spirit of fornication to gain it from him. And unfortunately, that happens to a lot. Like we saw the the man who got wealth by evil means, the devil gave him the wealth. Alahayim sought to help him by taking the wealth away, giving him hard times so he could come to repentance. But unfortunately, he didn't. So, you know, it's truly two sides, you know, deciding whose wealth we really want. If you don't have anything, Zach, well, I'll continue. No, go ahead, brother. Okay. All right. Now, the good thing about overcoming jealousy, too, is that not only will we be better mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, but also we can see people in the right light, having our mind in the light and our vision clear to look at them in love. You can tell by how Simeon saw Joseph as a brother in love when he came to repentance. Because remember, Simeon, Gad, Dan, they all hated their brother. They viewed him a certain way. But when they came out of the wrong spirits, their perception changed. If you'll read Simeon 4 and 4, please. Now Joseph was a good man and had the spirit of Allah within him. Being compassionate and pitiful, he bore no malice against me, but loved me even as the rest of his brethren. Sign of the spirit of Allah within you. Compassionate and pitiful, not bear malice, no matter what somebody's done. See how spiritual fornication and jealousy blinds us to see someone in the wrong light. How Gad hated Joseph through fornication's perception, as she herself isn't sober or moderate to look at things or a person temperately out of love. But when we come out of these types of spirits, as Simeon did in this verse, we can see and or appreciate people for who they actually are instead of who we may be projecting them to be from the children of fornication, like vainglory and jealousy's influence to cause us to give into that female spirit of wickedness who projects her views onto others, being in her feelings. All right? Can you read Wisdom of Solomon 17 and 11, please? For well, wickedness, condemned by her own witness, is very timorous, and being pressed with conscience, Always forecasteth grievous things. Now, wickedness, she's pressed by her own conscience. So she knows she ain't doing right. And it makes her timorous. And being in her feelings, it presses her conscience and then she forecasts grievous things on others. She pushes out negative views, negative influences because of her own wicked deeds. So that we can know if, if we find when we're not doing right, we start to overcompensate, going hard on others, 
or being real critical of others, that's wickedness at work. And it's a mechanism to keep us where we are because wickedness, she doesn't change. She just stays in that cycle. Okay. Well, that makes her feel better. Right. Just to feel, because she's a child of fornication. So she's in arrogance too, because that makes her feel better than others to be able to look down on them and forecast grievous things on them to see them as a certain person or to, to see what they have going on and go hard about it. Like, like I can see what they're doing. So that ain't right either. Or at least I'm not doing that. You know, I'm familiar with this wickedness. I've done it. So it's no good. It doesn't help change. That is one side of it, that it forecasted grievous things on people, but it also forecasted grievous things in general. So it can forecast like scenarios that may have never happened. Um, you'll be sitting there and you're like, man, if, if such and such does this, uh, I'm going to do this or whatever the case is, it's wickedness. You see that it's actually showing that it has a place in you and you're forecasting what wickedness wants to happen. For sure. That's accurate. Mm -hmm. The, um, you remember one of the, with the spirits of youth, the error, the spirits of error is that of error and fantasy. Mm -hmm. So wickedness, she would, you would be sitting there and it gets you like a doting moment. And, it for is literally grievous things. It's something, some projection. You're gonna see a fantasy, or some train of thought that's gonna lead to something that grieves you. It's about getting you in your feelings or keeping you in your feelings, in how she operates, because she's very timorous. Timorous means showing or suffering from nervousness, fear, or lack of confidence. We're going to eventually, when we talk about Satan and his family, we're going to get to down to a mind and it's the daughter of the devil. But lack of confidence in Allah, I am to be content. I'm seeking his will, trusting whatever his will is, will be. And whatever happens is good from him. It came from him. That'll help keep from her. But if we're not strong in that, we're going to struggle with getting nervous when things come up, being fearful. She'll forecast some grievous thing and we'll listen to it. We'll sit there considering it. It's going to put fear in our hearts, anxiety, or some lack of confidence. Oh, I wonder if Allah is going to deliver me. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, she's at work in all these things. So it's interesting, Casa. It actually shows where your faith is because majority of the time when you're forecasting or when wickedness is forecasting some grievous thing it's never Allah I am is going to deliver me from it it's what I'm going to do yes sir that's true that's true <clears throat> it puts things in perspective for us she is big to get to that faith of really trusting in Allah I am no matter what and changing that mindset of when those things come to know Allah I am delivers Allah I am is going to do what's best whatever he brings is going to be for the best that getting to that side of being cold to just stand on that it's going to strengthen out of it and work at it don't get deterred just because wickedness comes back you know i genuinely talk to you about it because wickedness is something i have to pay attention to because the reality is it says in levi all the spirits of pride and wickedness constantly attend upon the sons of levi i literally have to pay attention to the thing all the time it just is what it is praise allah and for it yeah, I had my I had my battles with wickedness. Praise Allah for prospering you, brother. Amen. Uh, my life was a little different before, so like 
it, it's interesting the way wickedness plays. It plays on your fears and it plays on like your doubt. And I mean, it plays on everything that you may have going on. So like, if it be somebody um, breaking into the restaurant and, and doing something like, like it don't matter, like wherever, wherever your, your doubt or your fear is, or something that, um, that you may not want to happen, it plays on it. Yeah. As you said, literally forecasting grievous things wherever she can. Right. Mm. Growing in that that simple seeking after Allah's will, delighting in it, and trusting that it's gonna happen one way or another helps to stay out of it. And sitting down. That's what I talked I mentioned earlier about knowing where you're in your feelings. Uh that's really essential to if you don't know yourself well enough to know when you're in your feelings, that's essential to take the time and slow down and get to know yourself. Cause if you can't catch yourself in your feelings, you won't be in the moment to see that this spirit is doing these things, to see where these words are coming from the grievous things, jealousy and vainglory saying this and that, wrath just waiting for you to get afflicted about it or get vexed about it, and then boom, wrath with lying. Like, you got to become self-aware. You got to come out from being hot. Yeah. So, that was a great... I understand was great. Helpful perspective for us. Put you in three sub categories so you can understand where you are, so you can know what you need to do. Amen. Amen. So, continuing here, we see wickedness. We see she also works in the midst of the children of fornication to project evil thoughts unto others or project grievous things, period. Think of her like she's projecting whatever it takes to get you grieved, to get you in your feelings. That's her ammo. And it's because she's condemned of her own witness. She knows she ain't doing right, so she's projecting. If we can get to be honest and humble, to be able to say, hey, I'm not doing right. Confess it and not be condemned in the sense of, oh, I'm not going to make it. I can't do it. So on and so forth. No. Being honest, confess to Allah, hey, I'm not doing right. I need some help. Let me get counsel. Let me reach out. Okay, let me go sit down on my couch and commune with my own heart and settle my spirit you got to get to where you, you're not just emotional about things, to be very practical, logical, and reasoning to be able to keep from these spirits or come out of them. All right. That's you know, interesting. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 I thought you were going to finish. Go um, ahead. That's interesting because for wickedness to have place, it means that your Allah didn't give us the spirit of fear. So, um, one when you're when it's forecasting grievous things or grievous events, Allah didn't give us the spirit of fear, but He gave us a power. So, just like what you're saying, even if you're forecasting on to other people because of your overcompensation or your your lack of whatever it is that you may be doing in your own walk or your own life. Um, he said, al didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power. We know power is the power to change, right? So if he didn't give us the spirit of fear, wickedness, that means that the devil gave us the spirit of fear or he implements fear. 
So then wickedness plays off of the fear. When Elohim wants us to change, he gave us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So it's through the, the devil's works in the first place or the devil having place in our hearts in the first place that actually gets place for wickedness to operate. Because if we were operating in love and in faith with a sound mind, then wickedness wouldn't have any place because we would cast the grievous things away. Okay. I know for myself, whenever wickedness tries to forecast something, I said, that's not true. Like, it's not true. So if, first off, with Yache, it's the truth. So if I'm believing a lie or a forecasting or a, a projection, then it's a lie in the first place because it's not true. And then that shows my lack of faith in Alahayim by not believing in the truth because Yache is the truth. So then I have to put on faith. I have to use power to then put on faith because doubt is operating. So now I have to say, hold up, that didn't happen. And whatever Allah will is, that's what's going to be. So now I have to put on faith. And then I have to have that love for my brother or sister if I'm forecasting on them or projecting on them. I have to have that love. Like, you know what? Allah prosper them. If they're struggling with something, Allah give them what they need so that they can prosper. Because love doesn't want something that's bad for the person that they love. They want all good things for the person that they love. That's true love. If I want something bad to happen to somebody I love, I actually don't love them. It's not true love. But if I want nothing but good things for the person that I love or that I say I love, then that is true love. Because I want them to prosper. But if I don't want somebody to prosper and jealousy or envy comes into the midst, then love isn't there. And I have to examine that. I have to examine myself. Am I being of a sound mind? And Allah I am. Because as we learn, these evil spirits, they don't have a sound mind. Only Allah I am and his spirits have a sound mind. So if we're going to be of that family, then we have to have the same thing. So, I see you put something there. You want to you want to say it? Oh yeah, when you finish. Go ahead. I'm done. That was good for the perspective of love towards others to overcome wickedness, projecting on others. It came to mind also overcoming wickedness, forecasting grievous things against ourselves. Because she'll go at any angle just to keep us in our feelings. Allah gave the spirit of power, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see in precept how his power actually works. In Colossians 1 and 11, it says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He's a father. He's translated us into his kingdom. This is something that will be. We're in the process of it happening. So he's chastening us. The devil has fear, causes us to fear we're not going to get to that point. 
But that's where the faith in Allah Hayyim comes in to believe that we will because he willed it and he's performing it. So with that mindset, knowing what he's translated us onto, give thanks for everything especially for being made partakers of the inheritance in light. The light is in the law. He's brought us to partake in his law by drawing us nearer to it to continue to expose the darkness so that we will be perfected. So knowing that when the faults come, when the mishaps come, the experiences come, take it with his power. And patience, long suffering with joy. That's going to help stay out of wickedness. Even in a mishap, it's going to help stay out of wickedness. Because we're thankful for it. Patient, the definition of it has to do with not getting angry or, or upset. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, troubling, or suffering without getting angry or upset. So I'm not where, I'm not perfect in the faith yet. All right, I'm where Allah wants me to be. I'm where he needs me to be right now in this season so I can learn what I need to learn. You show me my faults. It's not something to get upset about. And if I notice I'm upset, I need a reason about it and find the joy in it to remember what I'm pressing towards, the end goal of where he's taken me and to be long suffering with ourselves. Long suffering is having or showing patience in spite of troubles. It's going to be a process to get this right, but we have to be patient, not getting angry, or upset in spite of the trouble we have to go through within ourselves. That's essential to be able to get to the next chapter and continue pressing forward and also not be hindered by wickedness. And joyfulness. Now, so there's one part I wanted to touch on. You okay. said when you're corrected and you get upset about it, right? Okay. You really need to see why did you get upset? Because if it's, if it's something to help you grow, why are you upset? Is it because you didn't want to change? Is it because you desired or you had a pleasure in what it was that is trying to be changed? Those should be questions that come to you to then analyze why am I having such a hard time when Alahim does correct me or show my fault. Hey Amen. That was essential. Thank you for touching on that because that's a thing to deal with in itself. That's a part of the sitting down and regrouping and reasoning on what's going on. Because if you don't reasoning. know the, yeah. Because if you don't know the source of why you got upset, you're going to get upset again in the next instant. You didn't catch the root problem. Um, that getting upset for correction can come from different things for sure. The pleasure, like you mentioned, the pleasure and the desire, um, not wanting it to be because of the pleasure and the desire, and the pride, uh, vainglory, desire to be someone else, like not really wanting to be where we are or where I am, it will cause the vainglory because I want to be somewhere else. I'm not content with who I actually am and the work I need. So then the correction comes and I get upset because it's the reality check that I'm still where I am, though I don't want to be there. Instead of having that humble mindset to have already been in the truth and reality of who I am, so that when that correction comes, it's like, oh, hey, thank you. I see what you're talking about. I appreciate it. It's easy. I flow with it because that's the person I'm trying to overcome. You just pointed that out. Great. 
I get to see something that I miss so I can work on that too. Thank you. You know? But on the dichotomy, if it if it if you were calling out something that in my mind I've already overcame then I would take it to offense. Right. That's that you're pride. saying something, right? That you're saying something that I've already dealt with and you and you're wrong. That's the pride because and I don't need pride. that. Yeah. The pride turns a blind eye. Because the thing isn't gone. And the person called it out. But I had set my mind to it that it was gone because I didn't want it to be. So when they say something you're speaking against, I've created a false sense of self, unfortunately, in that scenario. And you're speaking against the new image I put up or the image I've reconstructed to as the facade. And when you say something, I would get offended because you're breaking down the image that I'm trying to uphold. But in humility, if you say something and I know who I really am and I'm not putting on a show or I'm not blinding myself to who I am, I'll take it in consideration. Like, you know what? How did you see that? Where do you, when you ex further explain what you're saying, okay, let me take a moment to think about that. And let me pray about it to be sure, because it's just not who I want to be, period. So I won't be sure that's not where it is. Okay. If your heart is for Allah Hayyam to show things and to correct things to make you a new person or to make you a new creature, then you should be looking for corrections. Because your own soul is going to be correcting you. And when other people correct you, you will take it well because you're looking for the correction. You want the correction. You want to be better. The only way you can get better is to be corrected or to be um or to be taught. Correction is teaching. According to the definite like Hebrew understanding of it. So it really just shows your heart. Yet again, we have to examine our hearts Entirely. in all aspects. Amen. I found it's not possible to really grow out of anything without having the right desire of heart for growth. Because you, I've been there with instances where I thought I grew, but I just put on another mask. Because I wasn't actually putting in the work, and my desire for it was for how it made me look, not for actually Allah Hayyam. And in due time, whatever it was I was struggling with, it would manifest. If somebody was around me long enough or somebody that understood the commandments was around me long enough. So there's a lot of people Allah has by themselves or in a small circle right now. And I would suggest praise him for it because the scripture says he chastens in secret. So Embrace the time you may have alone or in some type of minimal communication or minimal contact and work on you and your heart's desire so that you can actually grow from where you are and be able to help yourself and others when you actually grow out of these spirits so people can have an example that is possible right in front of them.
just by how you're living and the changes you're making and the focus you have on yourself. I totally agree with your brother Kasafo. Um, a lot of you guys should be embracing the moment, especially um, with where Alaheim has you. You're in a place where you can sit down, you can learn, you can study, you can practice, because Alaheim knoweth when when you're further in the faith. Because for us, I mean, I can speak to the people that is right here with us right now you're learning by the time new people come that are not further in the faith that are babes they're not going to have that compassion on you they're not going to have that patience with you they're going to expect you to have that for them not the other way around so as Casa is, is speaking and um, and encouraging to take the time now to actually get it right so that you can actually help somebody else and that you're not a, a hindrance to someone else and getting reproached because new babes, they will, they're going to reproach you. They're not going to, they're, they're, they're learning. They're coming to learn. They're coming out of the world directly to learn so the world is going to be with them so everything that they bring forth is going to be of the world and the way that they deal with things or the way that they speak it's going to be of the world so it's best for you to get it together with Alahim and, and really take the time and appreciate the time that Alahim has given you to actually put forth the effort and grow and to become the person that Alahim wants you to be in your seasons so that when that time does come, that you are a good example and that you are bringing forth fruit and that you're not actually putting on a mask because people can see a mask. I've never been, me personally, I've never been a fan of masks. Um, I had mentors, uh, father figures in my life younger that always told me to go at all things with 100% go at all things with a ram, like a ram, and don't let things linger. And that mindset really helped me in my life. And putting a mask on, I always looked at it as a Band-Aid. Like, yeah, I put a Band-Aid over it, but the wound is still there. As soon as the Band-Aid falls off, the wound is still open. Like, it has... It has chances of getting infected. It has chances of 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 getting hit again and wounded again. Um, like if I don't actually heal, then I didn't do myself justice. Let alone Alahayim in this regard. So, for you, for for anyone that struggles with putting on masks and not actually putting in the work to actually change their heart and actually change their outlook and perspective, then I would in, I would in, in sue you to actually put forth the work. And actually, it may be a little bit harder. You may actually have to humble yourself to actually get help for somebody to walk you through something. But at the end of the day, if somebody teaches you how to fish, you'll be able to catch fish on your own. And you won't be looking towards someone to help you feed yourself. So Allah and willing, we'll all be able to be fishers of men and we'll all be able to actually heal, truly heal, and not just put a mask on. Allah and willing. Amen. Thank you. Praise Allah. So hopefully that helps with some perspective in word building some reasoning and uh, in continuing our discussion we hope this helps to know how good it is to keep jealousy from our souls as not only will it keep us from the lust of fornication it also wouldn't help give place to wickedness to be 
projecting evil outlooks onto others or giving heed onto any grievous thing that's being projected towards us, against us, or outwardly. It's testament to Simeon chapter 4, verse 5, please. Beware, therefore, my children, of all jealousy and envy. And let's see how to actually do that along with love for all in uprightness, seeking after the judgment of Allah and for a peace of mind, like God said. Continue, please. And walk in singleness of soul and with good hearts, keeping in mind Joseph, your father's brother, that Allah may give you also grace and glory, blessing upon your heads, even as you saw in Joseph's case. So along with loving in uprightness of heart, seeking after the judgments of Allah for rest of mind and right perspective, we have to be single of soul towards Allah without another inclination, desire, or mind to see things another way. And we have to do that in a good heart, doing it for Allah That's where we have to take the time to really delight and have pleasure in Allah and His will to be able to do this truly. It has to be one-sided. This is as a just and humble man with a good heart and intent would do it, being just focused on not going against Allah in singleness out of love as the focus in life and always waiting for the will of Allah and hoping in the will of Allah. That hope is important too, that you can't lose hope and belief that you're going to get where you're working towards. Okay. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Got to have it. This is why Issachar never sinned, because he was single, just waiting on the will of Allah. There's nothing more that we need to help us overcome and grow. We talked about the motto of belief in Christ strengthening us and Allah enabling us. We also got to remember that righteous men have overcome and done good as well to know it's possible. So we don't doubt or be deterred thinking we can't do it as men. Joseph was an example of Yache amongst his brothers. So remember that he overcame the spirit of fornication and her children, and was prospered as a man, and that it was the same Yache who strengthened him to do it, so we can know we can do it too. Also keep in mind his ways in love and good fruits, and how he operated as an example for us of how to walk in love, overcoming fornication and her children like the ones we've talked about. Can you read that verse 6, please? All his days he repulsed us not concerning this thing, but loved us as his own soul. That's the spirit of love and fidelity to Allah. When someone trespasses against us, after we talk about it, and they repent by confessing and not doing it anymore, we don't bring it back up to throw it in their face, if you will or guilt trip them, nor tell others about it to make them look bad, lifting ourselves up to look better than them. We actually love them and put the stuff behind us, forgiven from the heart after talking about it and coming to terms when someone repents truly. If you don't have anything, continue, please. And beyond his own sons glorified us, and gave us riches and cattle and fruits. Do ye also, my children, love each one his brother with a good heart, and the spirit of envy will withdraw from you. Hopefully that helps know and strengthen us in that love for each person with a good heart 
having love as our boundary and walking in singleness of soul, doing what's right to Allah, not ourselves, being merciful and loving those who have even trespassed against us and repented. And if they don't repent, we forgive them from the heart nonetheless and seek the judgment of Allah on how to proceed with that relationship. Walking in that love with a good heart guided by the law will deliver us from envy and jealousy so that we don't be blinded and lose sobriety and moderation to be given over to the lust of fornication. It took Simeon two years to overcome that jealousy and envy that got him into the lust of fornication and Reuben seven years to overcome jealousy, lust, and fornication. So it's going to take work and willingness to strive temperately, not being given to passions and emotions about whatever may come in the growing process, taking every accident or mistake as a good experience from Allah for our good, knowing nothing happens without him, and it'll keep us from wickedness, forecasting grievous things. You have anything before we continue? No, I'm good. Okay. Some I mentioned that Joseph was an example at that time for his brothers. Thankfully, now we have Yache. So, walk in singleness of soul with a good heart and keep Yache in mind. The sacrifices he made, knowing that he, as a man, overcame the flesh by having a single mind, a single desire for the will of Allah and his law in his heart to know through that means we can too because it's him in us strengthening us to do it and Allah I am willing and working not taking each experience as good as essential being cheerful thankful for everything Hermas mandate 5 chapter 1 verse 1 please Be thou long suffering and understanding, he saith, and thou shalt have the mastery over all evil deeds and shalt work all righteousness. We gotta grow in those two spirits towards ourselves and others in order to overcome all the evil fornication causes and eventually work all the righteousness that pleases Allah. There is another spirit we need to pray for and work on along with those two to get the mastery. Continue in 1 Corinthians 9 and 25, please. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Understanding, long-suffering, and temperance. We pray and work on temperance, understanding, and long-suffering to overcome fornication and all its works and the children of fornication so that we can work all righteousness. Idolatry, listen to the wrong spirits, takes us from temperance in all things to get the mastery over the devil and fornication in our mind, perception, perspective, and senses. Working on our listening skills and slowing down to calm our mind and keep silence so we can be temperate to hear and understand Allah Hayyam's angels in faith is essential to getting a grasp and holding fast to his will in long suffering and humility. Uh, Naphtali 3 and 1, please. Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness. That means I have to be attentive of myself and my energy from my lust to slow down and be instant in prayer, not giving in to the haste and vexation of lust to fulfill a desire. All right. Or with vain words to beguile your souls. I also have to be mindful of going through the motions, talking or even praying, beguiling myself because my heart isn't really in it as I'm giving into the vexation of my desire already and the evil thoughts are still lingering 
while I'm talking because I truly still want the desire. But if I silence my mind in the moment and continue in prayer to Allah Hayyam, breathing to slow down and come out of the eagerness of lust, looking for Allah to help me, Allah Hayyam will deliver me away out of the temptation. Continue, please. Um, to piggyback on that one, um, definitely pray that Allah Hayyam will show you what to do. That helps in the in the moment. Like Allah Hayyam, show me if this one I'm supposed to be doing, or or this. Like if you're unsure and you can't like really get a grasp of right and wrong in the instance, either pray about it to Allah Hayyam, that He reveal it to you, or go to that man of understanding that you know to keep the law and have your counsel so you can actually get um proper direction yeah so we do nothing without discretion continue because, please Oop. because if you good because if you keep silence and purity of heart you shall understand how to hold fast the will of alahayim and to cast away the will of Belier. So, purity can be found in seeking after temperance, understanding, and long-suffering. Like three good parameters for ourselves is to stay in a space where we can be in the right heart. If we calm down, slow down, and strive to be temperate, quiet in our minds, and give ourselves a chance to think thoroughly before every action or speaking, or inquiring and waiting on an answer on Allah Hayyam before acting. And if need be, going to his counselors to know what his will is. So before making an action or acting on something, Letting him have the decision. He is our decision maker, our master, our controller. Okay. We will get to the place where we will understand Allah Ham's will and know the will of Belier that's seeking to trip us up, to cast it from us through haste. So you can see how, hopefully, you can see how, keep working on it to get to the place where we're actually doing it eventually it's going to become a norm for us eventually that's going to be how we operate and then we'll be on the cold side there won't be a division okay remember the serpent repeated his enticing words to eve to get her anxious so things that take away peace of mind like anxiety those racing thoughts and repetition of things in the mind, as we saw jealousy and vainglory when speaking to Dan. That isn't a sign to act on a thought, desire, or an inclination, but rather to slow down and wait to know the will of Allah Hayyam. Hopefully, we've gotten some good understanding on jealousy and how she works in things and gets other spirits to help get us into the spirit of fornication. And also, hopefully, we have some understanding of how to keep away from jealousy and these other spirits by getting our hearts in the right place, being honest with ourselves, aligning ourselves at Allah Hayyam, and really taking the time to be genuinely set on these things. Anything else thus far, Zakba? Yeah, um, I'm gonna take it a step, a, a step um further real quick if you don't mind. Um, eventually, Allah and willing, we can we can get to the place where where we're neutral, where we're always neutral. Because if we come into a, let's say we're inquiring of Allah of something, right? If we're inquiring and we're neutral we're going to be more keen to hearing it go either way. We're going to be more keen to getting an answer. 
we're going to be more receptive to the answer. But if we go into an inquiry and we're already biased, we're already leaning toward what we want, we're not going to be able to hear correctly. So it's very, very good. This is why when I spoke of earlier about me teaching my children that don't set your heart upon something unless Allah shows it. It's for you and that's what he's giving you because it helps you be neutral. And when you go and inquire, you're going to be neutral. When you're speaking to your spouse, you're going to be neutral. You're going to be able to hear both sides of it because you're not already leaning towards the side. It's hard to hear somebody when you already have your mind made up on what you want or what you want to do. And in this case, we're talking about keeping the law and bearing the fruits of the spirit or keeping the devil's law and bringing forth his spirits. So if you're already leaning toward one side, it's hard to hear the other side. That's it, Cos. Amen. Thank you. There's a precept, Psalms 37 and 4. Delight thyself also in Ahaya. This is what we've been talking about, essentially. Getting to the place where our delight is in Ahaya. And we know from that prior verse and think Psalms 40 and 8 that our delight will be his will because we're delighting in him as Yache is. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Zachor said he told his kids, don't set your heart upon something unless Allah wills it for you. If your delight is in Allah and his will, as you grow, the desire he's going to put in your heart is actually going to be according to his will. Therefore, he's going to give it to you because it's all aligned with him and within his order and what he wills so to understand that verse is actually speaking of a person that's actually delighted in Ahaya and delighted in his will to know we have to get there so that our heart will be designed the things that he wills and he'll give it because we're actually serving him so it's all good for perspective and understanding Amen. All right. In delighting ourselves in Ahaya, as we've been talking about today, it really comes with benefit. And in that delight, we just focus on doing good to reap the reward that he has for us. We're going to touch on this psalm to get some understanding or confirmation of what we've been talking about today. Can you read Psalms? 37 and 3, please. Trust in Ahia and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Trust in him. Faith by works. So I trust in him by doing good. Trusting in that, that you know, everything that comes is from him. It's good from him. Nothing happens without him. Build that trust. And we are going to dwell in the land that's to come. And we will be fed of that fruit of immortality. If something doesn't go your way, don't turn from the trust in Allah to not do good. If something doesn't go your way or if someone's not treating you the way that you um, you may feel yourself that you should be treated, know that everything comes from Allah and they're treating you that way because it's something that you have to learn and something that you have to grow in. Because if somebody treats you poorly and you give yourself over to some um, injury and then you go and sin, then that's something that you need to be strengthened in, right? So trust in the higher 
and do good. Always do good because you're doing it for him, no matter what's going on in your life. Amen. Verse 8, please. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. In that trust, don't let anything give us any sense of justification or right or, in, or inclination to do any evil. We've got to be mindful not to fret ourselves. Don't get anxious to give place to wrath or anger, passions, emotions, feelings that are outside of the passion or emotion or feeling to do Allah Hayim's will or to delight in his will. Keep from those things. Okay. Right. So don't get anxious to do any evil. All right. Don't get pressed to do evil. Like if that's why I said cease from anger and forsake wrath. Like if something happens that makes you angry or somebody does something that makes you angry, cease from that anger. Try to try to get away from anger as quickly as you can. Forsake wrath. Like you don't want to go and try to be wrathful toward that person or do something toward that person. Right. And be not anxious to thyself in any wise to do evil. So if somebody is, whether you're being peer pressured or you feel pressured because somebody wants you to do something that's not right, you got to stand. You can't be pressured into it. You got anything else, Kasa? Spread meant to glow or glow warm, to blaze up of anger, zeal, jealousy. You've got to know where you are, be honest with yourself. And Zachary said, come out of it quickly. And if you may be in this season where you don't come out of it quickly, it's okay. Be aware and go sit down. It's a growing process. Go sit down somewhere and commune with your own heart and come out of it before moving forward so you can keep from doing evil. Uh, Brett, um, the definition on Google said, be constantly or visibly anxious. Oh. Yeah, so. You're slowing down to help a lot so you get out of doing it constantly. And you hopefully you, you're paying attention to yourself to visibly know when you're anxious, knowing your mannerisms and what you do when you're anxious to start catching it and coming out of it. Yeah, that's what the devil likes to get us, where we get hasty and then you do evil because they, because of the haste. And that's what he's talking about. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Like you gotta come out of it. You have to come out of the anxiety to be able to gather yourself and be of a sound mind and make a wise decision according to the commandments and the fruits of the Spirit. And know when you're doing this, you're building your delight in Allah Hayim. All right, continue verse 4, please. Delight thyself also in Ahaya, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart how do you delight yourself in Ahaya? Continue, please. Commit thy way unto Ahaya. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, he's going to bring the desires of our heart to pass, right? If we commit our way unto him to make sure we're walking, doing what's upright, and trusting in him, taking everything as good, not letting anything get us into fretting to do it to get angry or wrathful to do any evil. What's the desire of our heart that he's going to bring to pass? Continue, please. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Because we set our heart to desire his will, 
in our heart, we're going to desire righteousness and judgment. And because we're committed in our way and putting the work in, trusting in him that he's going to do it and he's doing it and we're working to stay out of our feelings and do what's right no matter what, he's going to bring forth that righteousness that we desire and that judgment that we're seeking after in our heart because we're designed to be like Yache who said thy my my desires to do thy will thy laws within my heart so we're designed to have it in our heart too and he's going to bring it forth and as we build and meditate and on alahayam that's going to start to be how we think how we talk too you got some zakwa uh, one moment Okay. Um, judgment it says and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as noonday judgment is the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions All right. so pretty much you're going to be able to know the difference between good and evil It's amazing. So you're going to be able to know good and evil in the daytime to know that there's light, but you're going to be able to see correctly. Like there's not going to be any evil spirit or perversion or that's hindering you from seeing correctly. Or seeing in their specific point of view or their specific perception. Because if you're in fornication, you view everything from fornication. If you're in envy, you view everything from envy. If you're in anger, you view everything from anger. So you're going to actually be able to see. You're going to actually have proper judgment. Amen. It's that righteous fast of not fretting ourselves. We're fasting from the evil spirits and evil view. The more we don't give heed unto them, for Allah to bring forth the right view and perspective to us. And in time, it's going to become our view too, as we align with him. If you'll continue verse 23, please. The steps of a good man are ordered by Ahaya, and he delighted in his way. Eventually, we're going to get there to where we're actually ordering. Our steps are ordered by him. We're being taken through a process by him. This is why we don't fret ourselves for, for anything to do evil. And we take everything as good because he's ordering us, taking us through experiences to get us where he needs us. And in the midst of it, we delight in his way. Take everything with joy, pleasure, knowing you're helping me get to where my desire is your will and your laws in my heart. All right? And with that mindset, if you would continue, if you didn't have anything in that particular comment. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For a higher uphold of him with his hand. We have help. We're going to fall. It can happen. But it's not to cast us down. Because Allah Hayyam, he's actually holding our hand to bring us to him. To say, get up, my son, my daughter. Keep walking. This is the difference between the good mind and the mind of fornication. Knowing it's Allah Hayyam ordering us, it's Allah Hayyam upholding us, bringing us through experiences so that we can grow and learn to delight in his way and his will. Right? It says the steps of a good man are ordered by Ahaya. 
A good man has his heart towards Allah Hayyam. A good man, according to Allah Hayyam, is a man who's after his own heart. So the steps of a good man are ordered by Ahaya because he's trying to do everything that's right in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And he delighteth his way. And though he fall, there's going to be falls because you're going to be learning. You're learning to serve Allah Hayyam. So every time Allah Hayyam brings you into a new season, you're going to fall. Because you're doing something new. You're implementing something new. And when you're implementing or practicing something, you're going to you're not going to be very good at it. Okay? Until you get more experienced or seasoned in it. That's why it says when a righteous man a righteous man falleth several times, but he getteth back up. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. So yeah, you're gonna fall down to humble you. Like, okay, I need you, Alahayam. Like, yeah, I this is new for me. I need your help. I need you to prosper me in this. Yeah, you're going to fall down, but you're not going to be utterly cast down because your hope is on Alahayam. For Ahaya upholdeth him with his hand. Ahaya is going to make sure that you don't fall all the way down. He's going to let you fall to, to get to the place where you need or what you need to learn in humility and to trust in him and to have that faith. That he is actually going to uphold you. So. It's a growing process. Eventually. We're going to get. Where he's in our thoughts. And in our talk. Continue verse 30 please. The mouth of the righteous. Speaketh wisdom. And his tongue. Talketh of judgment. We're going to get there. We meditate on it and keep working. We're going to get there where that's our whole. Because as a man's heart, so is his mouth. We're going to get to where our heart's on his judgment and his wisdom. Continue, please. The law of his Elohim is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. We're going to get there if we go through this process. Now, even though we get there, the wicked is still going to seek to do what they do. These spirits are still going to attempt to deter us, but they won't have an effect. Continue, please. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Okay. Literally, that's what evil spirits are doing. They're attending and seeing if they have place and can find a way to get us killed by transgressing the law. All right. Ahaya will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Ahaya is actually, we're going to get tempted, but Ahaya is going to deliver out of the temptation, not leaving us in their hand. And then in the judgment, because we waited and were quiet and sought the way out, and found the way Allah Hayyam had for us out and followed it, we won't be condemned in the judgment when they try to accuse us because we actually did what was right. Continue, if you will. Wait on Ahaya and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Hopefully you understand how to wait on him now and keep his way and know the benefit to come to inherit the land and see the wicked be no more. Sakwa? Mm -hmm. I was laughing at verse 31. Uh, Psalms 37 and 31. It said, the law of his Allah is in his heart. All right. So the law is what we stand upon. Right. It's like it's just our foundation, right? So if the law is in our heart and it's our foundation, it says none of his steps shall slide. Like you know, like when you step on like ice and you and you like and you slide, mm -hmm. like and you're unstable, like you're completely unstable, and you mm -hmm. like you praying like please don't let me fall right? 
it's the opposite. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, said the law, he said the law of his Allah is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Like you're completely grounded. Like and you're not moving. Like you're cold. Right. His feet on solid ground, a clear path. You understand? Right? Because part of it is understanding. Like when you understand, then you have the experience, you can stand away from it, and then you start putting on the, the versions and, and the laws in your heart. I mean you, you become unmovable. Hmm. You can't slip when you're being carried. We talked about the good desire actually carries. Yeah. Guided. So with that for now, hopefully it's helpful, encouragement, focus, and understanding of fidelity to Allah Hayyam to overcome the spirits of fornication and idolatry. And the next teacher, we're going to continue understanding fornication and what we need to do to stay aloof from it. Anything else, Zachra? I hope the, the lessons have been great for everyone. Uh, we hope everybody is growing and gaining understanding. That's what we're speaking of right now. And we hope with that understanding that you're able to stand and able to truly be a faith and be a believer. Um, we 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 pray Allah Hayyam. We see the the growth in those that are around us, and we pray that Allah Hayyam keeps prospering them, and Allah Hayyam keeps prospering us to continue growing and continue learning. Um, praise Allah Hayyam for it, and we we hope to see the the end results of Allah Hayyam's work in all of us. Amen. Amen. Chavata Chalam and peace be with you all. Peace be with you all. Chalam. HRC, 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 HRC,